you see, having gone through the Beatlemania thing, nowadays it's nothing like that. I mean, I can walk down the street and somebody will say, oh, hi, John, and they usually say, how's yeah. your immigration, you know, if it's in New York, right? And they don't hassle me. I might sign one autograph, two autographs, you know? And I don't get hassled. And I went through that period where I actually couldn't go anywhere. And so now it's like heaven. I can go and eat. We go and eat. We go to the movies. We go wherever we want. John Lennon was walking down a street on the west side of New York last night between 10 and 11 o'clock Eastern Time when he was shot down by an assailant. He is dead tonight in a senseless and terrible, terrible moment. The interview that you just saw, the portion of that interview, was first recorded here in New York at the NBC studios during April of 1975. And to this day, the John Lennon Show, as it is called in the Tomorrow series, is still one of the most often requested programs for repeat purposes. And we're going to run the entire interview tonight, not because it's a terrific interview or it's terribly entertaining or enlightening. It is, after all, five years old. But curiously, it turns out that possibly this interview is the last television interview that John Lennon ever did. It contains no historic information, nothing terribly new, but after all, it is a little bit of stuff and substance of a man who was part of a change, a revolution, if you will, in popular music back during the 1960s. And during the 1970s, John Lennon found a new lifestyle for himself, which he will discuss during this interview. A bit later on, we have Lisa Robinson, who did one of the last interviews with John Lennon, which will appear in the New York Times syndication service later on. And Mr. Jack Douglas, who produced uh, John and Yoko Ono's current album, Double Fantasy, who was with John and Yoko shortly before his tragic death here in New York last night. Uh, we'll be right back to run the 1975 interview with John Lennon after these announcements, and I hope that you'll all stay with us. We'll be back here in about two minutes and five seconds. promised, here is John Lennon, and a little bit later on in the program, we'll talk about the possibility of his having to leave the United States, and at that time, his attorney, Mr. Leon Wilds, will join us to make certain that John or I make no mistakes in the legalities. But I welcome you here, and I'm glad that you're here. As I said at the outset, uh, back in 1964, uh, after the, the cataclysmic arrival of the Beatles here in the United States and the great popularity you had on the Ed Sullivan program yeah. and others, there were many people who did not really understand what you were doing, and, and they thought then that your hair was long and that you looked modest, you know, mm. and you were, were revolutionary. Uh, does it surprise you at all that it took so many of us such a long time to get into your act and to realize what you were doing? Uh, no, it was mainly parents, and they were against rock and roll, you know. Anyway, before the Beatles came along, I mean, people have been trying to stamp out rock and roll since it started. Why do you think that is? What, is the, what are they afraid uh, of? I always thought it was because it came from black music, and the words had a lot of double entendre in the early days. And it was sort of, you know, the white kids, our white, nice wasps are going to go crazy with all this moving their bodies. You know, and the music got to your body, and the Beatles just carried it a bit further, made it a little more white even than Elvis did, mm -hmm. because we were English, you know? And uh, people couldn't hear it. That's, that's why they didn't understand well, it. Well, that they brings up an interesting it, you know? point. You know, one could never understand the words until one sat down with the record album. I went to a couple of, perso of your personal appearances, including one in, I think, in Philadelphia in 1965 in an outdoor location. Oh, yeah. And there, were, uh, there was so much screaming and so much carrying on and did that bother you at all when you were doing those concerts? That people couldn't hear your music, that they, all they heard was, was themselves screaming? It got a little boring. I mean, it was great when it first happened. When you'd come on, there'd just be nothing but wah, you know? But then we just became like lip syncing, you know, miming. And uh, we didn't, we almost, we, sometimes things would break down and nobody would know. And so it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't doing the music any good, you know? When you guys were in the dressing rooms after these concerts or when you were in the dressing room after the Ed Sullivan show where, my heavens, young people were just almost flinging themselves on stage, yeah. didn't you ever wonder, are these people crazy? Are we that good? Can we really produce this kind of reaction in people? Uh, we didn't think if, whether we're that good or not. You've got to think you're good to, to do what we did, you know? Uh, it was it was like being in the eye of a hurricane, and so we never there was never a time when you thought you thought what's going on, and that was about as deep as it got. What is happening, or what you know? You'd suddenly wake up in the middle of one a concert or a happening, and think, what, what? How did I get here? You know, mm -hmm. the last thing I remember was playing music in a club, and the next minute this. But we never thought about it too much because it was an ongoing thing. It was happening to us, and 
it was hard to see. You know, we were just in the middle being ushered from room to room. As I recall, there were fan clubs or, or, or clubs of followers formed yeah. for each yeah. of the individuals in the organization. Well, it was mainly a Beatle club, but, you know, they sort of fanned it out a little just to keep the... And I'm just wondering how unified any group can be. And I'm not singling out the group that you belong to, the yeah. Beatles, but how unified can any group be when the audience has certain favorites, maybe they like Paul more than they like John or, or something <laughs> like that. And I wonder, <laughs> <laughs> I got right to it, didn't I? Yeah. I, I, I just wondered if, if, if it's awfully difficult to be friends, and do you really care about whether or not you're friends uh, when you are a group such as the Beatles oh, or yeah. whether you're the Rolling yeah. Stones or, or whoever? Uh, we didn't break up because we weren't friends. We just broke up out of sheer boredom, you know and boredom creates tension. How can you get bored doing what you did? Because it was going on, it was not going anywhere, you know? We'd stop touring, and the, we, we'd just sort of say, time to make an album, you know, go in the studio, and we'd, the same four of us would be looking at each other and playing the same licks. And those silly haircuts, yeah. Those silly haircuts <laughs> that you have now. You see, yeah. he notices he's got his now. <laughs> and uh, we, we were very good friends, and we'd known each other since we were 15, you know? And we got over all the actual fighting the real nitty-gritty, dirty, you know, stuff, which had nothing to do with how popular we were. The same popularity, meaning Paul was always more popular than the rest of us, was going down in the dance halls in Liverpool, so it didn't come as any big surprise, you know? I mean, the kids saw him, the girls would go, ooh, you know, right away. So we knew where the score was there. But it was a, a group, it was the music that was interesting, that was important, you know, not who was, you know, as long as we were, you know, going forward and going somewhere, it didn't matter. But all of a sudden there just right, wasn't yeah. any further progress. It was the same old, same old over and over again. Yeah, yeah, it just got like um, a marriage that doesn't work or something. Now, there are some groups that are quite open in their advocacy in the music that they present. They advocate uh, social justice. Uh, they call for an end to war. They, they wish for a time when there might be a change in the drug possession laws. Your music did not do that. There wasn't a great deal of out and out editorialization in the songs that the Beatles did. At least I didn't feel it and I don't think that a lot of parents felt it. Now all our messages were subliminal, you know. <laughs> Meaning we were, we were sending messages out, all right, but... Uh... Yeah, but what kinds of messages? Just reporting on the state we were in, you know, looking back on it. And uh, we, we made things like All You Need Is Love, you know, which is well, that's pretty was wholesome. our version that's of... That's a pretty wholesome yeah, message, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that's wholesome. But it's, it was still a change in attitude. We were part of that psychedelic stuff. But which groups you talking about this advocate change? Well, I, you know, I really don't know them offhand, except I sat down one evening with David Crosby, and we were talking about ah. some songs that have been done by a number of groups, and, I, and since I don't have them fixed in my memory, it, I shouldn't say it was the Rolling Stones or oh, it, it was this Stones. or that or the other thing. It must thing. have been people doing Dylan songs, more likely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Are we on or what? No. Yes, we are, are on, on, but we're on back there. Did you want to turn around and wave to no, the people? I'd just like to know where it's coming from. All right, you're uh, yeah, over here, and the... I'm over there, and we're over there. Yeah. Huh? Hi. How are you? I'm all right. Nice to be with you. Yeah, I like the set now. It's got better, you know. I mm -hmm. watch the show all the time. Thank you. Mm. But in any event, your message was subliminal. You didn't have any axe to grind with social injustice, or did you? No, our only axe was uh, we were the first working-class singers that stayed working-class and pronounced it, didn't try and change our accents, which in England are look, were looked down upon, probably still are, like a Bronx accent, it's equivalent to that. No. We, the only change was our image, you know, get being slightly... Get, what, get, what do you want? What do you get want? me off the hook. Yeah, a, Bronx you're right. a Bronx accent, it could be a Brooklyn accent, it could be... Oh, yeah, Brooklyn accent. was the one I meant, okay, actually. Okay, all right, fine. Just get me off the hook. Because that sounds like Liverpool. They talk like that, they do they, you know? I mean, all the stars <laughs> in England before... There were a couple of sort of rock and roll stars before us, but any major star in England had to change his voice. They, they do it in America to get on TV and radio, right? Uh, Hi, I'm from nowhere. That, the one George mm -hmm. Carlin does. Well, that goes in England, too. Do you know that I once took an audition at a station in the southern part of the United States with a young woman who wanted to do the weather forecast on the, on the television station? And for some curious reason, a southern accent at that time was not acceptable even in the southern United States. And so she asked the engineers if they could put the filter on the microphone that took the southern accent out of all of our voices. <laughs> 
And of course, there is no such filter. No. And you had to be there, and then you would have realized how humorous that was at the well, time. Well, I, I laughed, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, but you laughed because you're a good guy. No, filter, <laughs> I understand the business, you know, recording, filters. Look funny from the side. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Go on. I don't think you look so. No, look it's to the not side bad. again. It's not no, bad. it's not bad. I'm, you're just not used to seeing yourself sideways. That's what it is. Uh -huh. were, were, were the Beatles before the groupies, or did you have those? Oh, we had them, yes. <laughs> I mean, not did you have them, but were they? They didn't call around? them. Well, did you have them? I guess <laughs> they that's were great, bit. Tom. They were huh? great. Uh, they didn't call them groupies then. I forgot what we used to call them. Something like <laughs> slags, you know. Slags. So there's some word they had in England for it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the main reasons to get on stage is it, uh, it's the quickest way of making contact, you know. And, you know, you went to see those movies with Elvis or somebody in it when, when we were still in Liverpool, and you'd see everybody waiting to see him, right? And I'd be waiting there, too. And they'd all scream when he came on the screen. Right? So we thought, that's a good job. That's why most uh, musicians are on stage, actually. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> to get a little Tom, to get a little extra. What, a little extra money? A yeah, little, uh... yeah, you know what it is. It is two o'clock, right? We're all right. No, you've got to be kidding me. Is that the, one of the big reasons, the sexual aspects of singing? That's the reason most of these great dedicated I would say that artists any are on stage, that they don't care about their music, that they're just up there for a little extra? No, no, but that is a good incentive. For all performers, let's not just pin down the poor musicians. And it wasn't in... Well, you speak for yourself, John. Well, I, all right. I can't speak for musicians, then. No, and please don't speak for those of us who toil in the television vineyard, because oh, yes, that is yes. the farthest thing from our minds. Of course. Yes. yes I understand that. <laughs> now, and Got you to do say... The news as well. And then you? I could assume that when you say that going on the stage to perform music is one of the best ways of making contact, yeah. that what you're saying is it's one of the best ways of making sexual contact. Hmm? Well, yes, we're not looking to have a card game. That's what it is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, know, you don't go on stage and think, that would make a nice card game. Most of the young women who, uh, who follow the rock groups then were very, very young. They were in their teens. And I just wonder if ever there was a problem where an irate father or mother might have called the dressing room on occasion and said, hey, what's going on down there? And, and you probably said, quiet, there's a card game going on. Yes, yeah, sure. No, I mean, in the very early days when we were playing dance halls, there were just a certain type, which you call groupies now, which would be available for functions at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. And in general, most kids would just go home with their boyfriend or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was always a small group that just went for any performer. They didn't care whether it was a comedian or a manuette glass, you know, as if it was on stage. Right, the guy who swept up after the elephants. Hey, yeah, where are you going? right, yeah. right. And actually... Uh, the people that work for rock groups usually get more action than the actual rock group, <laughs> right? Cause they, I don't, don't say right to me because I Well, you can imagine it, Tom. They, they audition. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> they get the cream of the crop, you know. If you want to see Elvis, you've got to see me first. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. As you said, mm -hmm. right. Let me pause here for these announcements from our affiliated stations. We'll continue with John Lennon in two minutes and five seconds. You said earlier that it became boring to stay with that group. Why is what you're doing now not boring when that was? Because I can change musicians whenever I like. And it tends to get into a format, you know? Because we were together much longer than the public knew us. You know, it wasn't just from 64. I was 24 in 64, and I've been playing with Paul since I was 15. And he's very nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and George about a year later or something. So it's a long time we spent together in... in all the most extraordinary circumstances from, you know, lousy rooms to great rooms. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just a, the public just think, oh, you were only together five years, we've only got five million records, you know. But we were together a long, long time, and it, we just became stale musically. But how are you not stale musically now, aside from changing because musicians? Because I'm interacting with different musicians. To me, they're musicians, they're not just, you know, it's not uh, like, to people, they're all stars, right? It's, it's like having Elton John and Elvis and a few people playing, you know. To me it isn't, it's just musicians, and to them it's the same. So if you play with the same person all the time, you get into a rut. Even if you play tennis with the same person. It's boring. It comes to a time when you know every move, and you have to find somebody else to play with.
As you listen to music today, I don't know if you listen to the yeah. radio a lot or if you listen mostly to records, but what are things that you see that you think are good or bad? Well, that's pretty general. I like the disco music that's out now, which is uh, great, great music. I like the thing that happened in Jamaica called reggae. Happened a few, there's a music in Jamaica called reggae, which has been around for years under the disguise of ska, blue beat, etc., etc., but it finally formed itself into reggae. And that's about the really newest thing that's happened in music in the last five years or six years. Do you years. think anything new happens to music, or is it a, a continual series of cycles, and that maybe 100,000 years ago somebody had the same kind of beat or the same kind of whatever it is that makes it different, and that maybe the whole thing is just going in cycles, or are we in fact discovering things all the time? I think uh, the, there's a, something to the cycle thing, but I think if you apply the cycle idea to it, that's a cycle for everything, not just music. You know? mm -hmm. But it's snowballing either with just because of electricity or because of all the garbage everybody picks up, because you know, we keep inventing things, right? So it, it does change, and it has cycles in a way, you know, like I think the whole, the whole whatever it is, the universe is a series of cycles. But the music has to change because they keep inventing new things, like, you know, films change, it's now video, so it's, in that way it's different. But don't you know that in about 1988 there's going to be a group come out that is going to pick right back to the sound that you guys had in the, uh, since you're 15 years old, and all kinds of critics and all kinds of writers are going to say, wow, look at this, we've got this whole new sound that's reminiscent of the Beatles back in the 60s. Well, they'll probably be playing Grutsch blobs and Zack Dungas, right? You know, they'll have new instruments. And although rock and roll was brand new when it came out and excited everybody, it was sort of, it had roots in blues and jazz. So in that way, they would have their roots in the 60s, 70s, and possibly further back. But you can't say that rock and roll is like the 20s music, although if you look for it, you can find out where it came from. Mm -hmm. And you can find out where Beatles music came from, or any music came from. It's just like, it, ha it has its history. Before we get into your, your immigration status, and we'll bring Mr. Wilds out at that time. Hooray! Hooray! And that is a controversy for you and for yeah. people who would want you to stay in this country. You've been involved in some other mini controversies, like the time that you were on the cover of the album without any clothes on, and like the yes. time that you and Yoko had everybody or invited people to come into the bedroom while you were there. We held a bed in for peace. A, yeah. a, a bed in for peace, exactly. Mm. Well, why do you do those things? What, what, I, and, and I don't ask you that uh, because I want to engender some flip response from you, but what does that gain for you? as John Lennon, or what does it gain for the cause of peace in the case of the bed in for you to do something like that? Uh, Yoko and I, when we got together, decided that whatever, we knew whatever we did was going to be in the papers, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Richard or Liz or so-and-so gets married or whatever people like us do is going to be in the papers. So we decided to utilize the space we would occupy anyway by getting married with a commercial for peace and also a theatrical event. And the theatrical event we came up with, which utilized the least energy with the maximum effect, was to work from bed. And what we virtually had was a seven-day press conference in bed, where the press fought the first day, they fought at the door to get in, thinking there was something, you know, sexy going on. And then they Licentious. found... Licentious. Like, that was the word I was looking for. And they found two people talking about peace, you know. And reporters always have five minutes with you, or ten minutes with you. We let them ask anything for as long as they wanted for seven days. And all the time we just kept plugging peace. And the story that came out was John and Yoko do bed in for peace. And we were just promoting peace, like you promote any product. You know, they promote war, join the Marines, join this. We were promoting peace. Mm -hmm. uh, the Naked album cover was less um, general than that. Meaning they didn't have, we didn't have, that was the f one of the first things we did. We thought, you know, we felt like two virgins, that's what the album was called, because we were in love, just met, and we were trying to make something. And we thought, to show everything, people always looking at people like me, trying to see some secret, or what do they do, what do they do, you know, do they go to the bathroom, do they eat? Do you? I do, quite a lot, you know? And the, we, I just, we just said, here, you know. 
And that was in 1968, and all hell broke loose. But now they're jumping around naked all over the place, right? Yes, they are, as a matter of fact. Right, so we were just sort of ahead of our time. <laughs> <laughs> what difficulties are there for people who are in the public, uh, public eye, uh, who know, as you and Yoko did, that whatever you do, it's going to be picked up in the press, and, and you really can't go out and, I suppose, have a quiet dinner or go to the park or go to a movie or something like that? What... What difficulties are there in, in, in your life when there's such adulation for you and such curiosity about what you do all the time? Well, that's cool because that, that's part, I reckon that's part of the What, part price, of the territory? You know? Yeah. But, uh, you see, having gone through the Beatlemania thing, nowadays it's nothing like that. I mean, I can walk down the street and somebody will say, oh, hi, John, and they usually say, how's yeah. your immigration, you know, if it's in New York, right? And they don't hassle me. I might sign one autograph, two autographs, you know? And I don't get hassled. And I went through that period where I actually couldn't go anywhere. And so now it's like heaven. I can go and eat. We go and eat. We go to the movies. We go wherever we want. If there's an announcement, like there's an opening and everybody's going to be there, you get a lot of noise and cameras and flashbulbs. But if we just decide to go to dinner, it's cool. You know? We're probably less recognizable than you now. Being oh, on I every doubt night. that. I doubt that. You're on every night. Are you kidding? But it doesn't make any difference because when you were on, you had... 35, 40, 50 million people. I'll never forget the time that you came to Los Angeles. I was working there for, uh, for uh, Channel 5, and you were giving a concert at, uh, I don't remember where it was. Hollywood Bowl, is that right? Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, there were the lines for the tickets, and there was all the attendant publicity prior to the appearance and everything mm -hmm. else. And uh, one of our reporters went out and covered all this, and he came back and he said, it's going to be wild out there tonight. And I, because I'm not very smart, went on the air and I said, well, if you'd like to know where the Beatles are, call this guy and his home number is. And I mean, his phone didn't stop ringing for four days. It yes. was just an obscenity. And I wish to, if he's watching, I'm sorry I did that. And so your, your viewability or your visibility is so tremendously high, or at least was then. And I just wondered if it had kind of slopped over I I into your career now. No, I mean, I can get around now. You know? I can get, I'm glad, too. I don't miss it. I'm glad it happened, but I don't miss it. Yeah, I like in spite of the boredom, the in spite of the fact that maybe there were, there were little dissensions, those were good times for you. Oh, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the boredom was in the music. I mean, that came after all the, the Beatlemania. Did you save your money? Uh, what we could get our hands on, yeah. What do you mean, what you could get your hands well, a lot on? of it got siphoned off before we even got near it, you know? I mean, we didn't know anything about business or anything like that, you know? And there's a lot of money. There's a lot of millionaires around this world, so, yeah. But uh, that's part of the action, too. Okay. Let me pause here for these announcements. We'll continue with John Lennon on tomorrow in two minutes and five seconds, and I trust you'll stay tuned. Thank you. Among other things, watching this again proves how dumb people look when their hair is too long and they wore those leisure suits. Awful. Uh, we'll get back to this interview with John Lennon, recorded in April of 1975, after these announcements for the NBC television stations, Coast to Coast. I'll try to make this the last question I ask about, about, about the past and about the Beatles. You must watch what your former colleagues are doing, and do you derive satisfaction from it? Are you happy for their successes? Yeah. yeah. I'm most happy, I guess we all are in a way, uh, for Ringo's success. Because the, the other three of us, you know, it always went around Ringo was dumb, but he ain't dumb. But he didn't have that much of a writing ability, and he wasn't known for writing his own material. And there was a bit of a worry that, you know, although he can make movies and he does make movies and he's good at it, that how was his recording career going to be? And in general, it's probably better than mine, actually. So he's And doing what's all right. amazing I'm is that he's that. done it with some songs that were popular when you and I were both teenagers in this yeah, country. Yeah, a lot of your 16 and things like that. Mm -hmm. Stuff that, you know. Oh, my, my. Well, I think he wrote that. Is that an oldie? Only You. Oh, Only You. I suggested that for him. You did? Yeah. Now, why is it that those songs done by Ringo Starr achieved this popularity when they were popular 20 years ago? Because a good song is a good song. Okay. You know, and you can jazz it up or do it with whatever rhythm you like. But if the song is there, it stands. When musical groups become successful, or musicians, or really when anybody in the public eye becomes successful, immediately there are rumors about their personal lives and I suppose the fact that some people are caught in the possession of certain unlawful sub substances like marijuana or cocaine or LSD or speed. 
a lot of people say that's all they do. They smoke yeah. a lot of grass, they eat a lot of LSD, they're all acid heads and they're all, rock, uh, yeah. all, all rocked out. How much of it is there going on in truth? I wouldn't know, you know, I mean, <laughs> what do I know? Come on, John, come on, come on, come on. Come I know on, as much on. as you. Come on, you know? come on, come on. In well, truth, I don't how much any. of it goes on where, you know, it depends where. Well, in, in your little uh, coterie in, in of my, friends. Uh, my friends are as clean as a whistle. I'm home. sure they are, as a, as a hound's tooth, in the words of General Eisenhower. But, uh, I'd say there was as much dope in the music business as there is in virtually any other business now. The dope is so out in the open that you can go anywhere and it's there. So there's no sort of underground movement of people taking dope, you know? The most extraordinary straight people are taking dope, including cocaine. It's available anywhere at any time. And it's all over the place. If you want it, you can have it. You know? And it's no more predominant or prevalent in your industry than it is in insurance, in retailing, and in selling tires. Is that what you're saying? I think you'll find a lot of middle class people of, in their mid-30s who grew up in the 60s have marijuana and now cocaine around like you'd have a glass of wine. You know, I'm not saying it's good, you know. And uh, cocaine's not too good for you at all, you know. But I'm saying that it's there, and a lot of perfectly, quotes, ordinary people use it. If you were to be approached by the National Council on Drug Addiction, or yeah. whatever the name yeah. of the agency is, to make one of those little films that run on television, you'd say, yeah. Hi, I'm John Lennon, and I like to tell all young people that dope is a bummer and cocaine is bad. Would you do that? I mean, do you, do you believe that strongly in that? Uh, it would depend how the advert was made, you know. Because you can't bull blank the kids, because they know more about dope than I do now. There's drugs on the market that I don't even know what they are, mm -hmm. you know? And so if it was done the way I would like to do it, I would I, I How might would you like do to it. do it? I'd have to think about it. I'd have to talk to whoever asked me to do it, you know? I mean, it's no good me saying, hey, dope is bad, don't do it, you know? They say, what? so what? who are you? you know? Well, you have a certain following among young yeah, people, and they people, might listen to you, whereas they would not listen to Yasha Heifetz, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, but people, it, there's an illusion that people, just because somebody buys your record, that they're going to do what you tell them. It doesn't work that way. If I tell them, go jump in a river, just because they buy my record. No, you know, not at all. Right? But certainly, you'd be surprised how people who appear on television or people who appear before audiences are looked towards for some kind of personal insight into the world or their yeah, own I lives that, that, that. that a lot of times those people don't even have. Yeah, they might ask questions of famous people, but they, in actuality, you cannot tell people anything. They have to find out for themselves. I mean, you can leave signposts saying, you know, it's dangerous here or you can fall over there, but it, in reality, you know, it's no good telling people anything. They have to find out. What part did drugs play in leading to the present circumstance in which you find yourself? And I think we can tell that part, yeah. and then we'll bring... Uh, 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 Leon Wilds. Mr. Wilds out, and he will be here for the discussion of your mm. immigration procedure. In the late 60s, there was a headhunting cop who was not very high up in the drug de department in London, which was pretty new anyway. They had two dogs for the whole department. And he went round and bust every pop star he could get his hands on, and he got famous. And some of the pop stars had dope in the house, and some of them didn't. It didn't matter to him. He planted it or did whatever. Later on, that's what he did to me, because at that time I didn't have any drugs. And, uh, he what? He planted yeah, something he in plant, your house. He, he planted dope. marijuana in your yeah. house, didn't now, he? I'd, at or the you time, say he did. Yeah, I mean, I say he did. I know well, I did. have to say that yeah, because okay. I wasn't there. Well, he's not going to get us. We're in America, okay. all right? He's in jail now, by the way, because he later got to be top dog, and uh, he had a big drug scandal thing going, like the one that was going over here, that, the big investigation in the New York police when I was first here, mm -hmm. the one, the Serpico thing. Well, we had a little one in England, which happened after I left, and he was caught in, in Australia trying to escape. You know, the English always run to Australia thinking they're going to vanish there. You know? So <laughs> he was caught. And I didn't think Can't about... Can't vanish in Australia. Everybody knows it's down there. Yeah, but they always have the illusion that if you go to Australia, you get away with it. You know? Sure. And I, I, at the time, didn't even think I was 
bust. And to cut a long story uh, that, I, that he planted me, to cut a long story short, I'd just moved into an apartment and I'd had everything moved from my other apartment. It was all over the place. So I thought, well, maybe this is a bit of the hash that was left over. And I'd forgotten all about it. Possibly that was what happened, you know. And I just copped a plea, you know. He said, I won't get you for obstruction if you cop a plea. And I thought, oh, it's a hundred dollars or whatever, you know. It's no skin off mine. I was little thinking it would reverberate. And he said, oh, you know, I'll let your missus go, you know, because they never... In England at that time, the law was, if it was in this building, Mr. NBC would be caught for it. You know, he was responsible for it, even if he wasn't living there. That was the law there. I was mean under that, that if an law. officer of the law were to come in here... Yeah. <clears throat> ...and they were to find an unlawful substance upon these premises, John... Yeah. ...that the president of this television network would be liable would be to liable. arrest if yeah. that law were in effect? That was an English it's law at the time that's been changed. <laughs> yeah. So you better put it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is... No, no. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't do that to old Tom. See that old no, filler well, there, folks? Knows got the you're... writing right here on the paper now. Come we on. all know you're a nicotine addict. Anyway, the guy planted me, and it didn't dawn on me till later till I called a few friends who'd also been bust and said, did you have stuff? One of them said, yeah, I did have stuff. It was on the table. They didn't even notice it. They planted a whole pile in my bedroom. Uh -huh. You know, he had it out on the table, some marijuana. So the, the guy was a, a rip-off and he's in jail and the, half that drug department's in jail too. But now, you but thought now, that all you'd yeah. have to do was pay the $100 yeah. fine, but then what happened? Well, I did just pay the fine, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the end of it. And it went in the papers, whoopee, and another pop star bites the dust, you know. And then I, I came over to America and just, with no particular decision, decided that I'd like to live here, you know? I came over for a visit or something, and I, I was always coming and going and coming and going, and Yoko had been educated here, and she was always going on at me about New York, you know, and she finally showed it me and walked me around. And I fell in love with it, and we thought, get an apartment instead of staying in a hotel all the time. Surely. So the next minute we thought, hey, well, let's stay, you know, isn't it great? So we, and we also had other complications going on. The show isn't long enough for it about her ex-husband running away with her daughter and there was court cases in Houston, the U.S., Houston, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we had to keep applying for these visas. And after your bust, it's suggested that you don't apply for nine months, you know? And uh, people now have problems getting in. Mick Jagger, Stones, lots of musicians, Paul. Lots of people have, pr they have to sort of do a lot of ritual to get in before they can come and go. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we tried to say, look, we have this big case, we need to come in. And there was always a hassle and a hassle and a hassle. And then they started trying to throw me out. All right, so we're at the point now where it might be helpful to have Mr. Wilds, your attorney, present, yeah. just so that nothing is said that might prejudice Well, or... it's really in case you have a question that I can't answer. You know, they ask right. me what's happening with you, and I say, well, there's some paper went to some senator that called, and I don't know who... who All they right, are. fine. We will have Mr. Leon Wilds, uh, Mr. Lennon's attorney, join us after these announcements. Tomorrow we'll take away from Manhattan in two minutes and five seconds. Joining John Lennon with us now is Mr. Leon Wilds, his attorney, and if any questions come up as to, the, uh, as to where it stands or where it is in the courts or legal appeals or whatever, you, Mr. Wilds has the expertise to speak to those points, plus he looks nice on television. You were told it might be a good idea to wait for nine months before applying for citizenship? For no, no, for, this for was um, after the bust in England before applying to visit the United States. I see. That it would be a cool idea. That's sort of, you know, it, it would be a cool idea. What is your status in the country right now? That's why Leon's here. What, what am I, Leon? Well, John was charged with being deportable in the United States for being an overstay by a very interesting um, uh, turn of events. The district director of the New York Immigration Service charged uh, uh, him with being an overstay after he gave him a two-week extension of his time. And in the middle of that two-week period, he, he was here on it. visa, right? And he yes. overstayed? Is that, is that he, the position? He had the... originally come in as a visitor, and he had had a number of extensions. And then finally, the Immigration Service gave him a two-week extension. And right in the midst of that two-week final extension, they revoked the period that they had given him and they declared that he had been here as an overstay for the week that he had been here with their authorization. And mm -hmm. thus the Immigration Service created the very status that they charged him with being deportable for. We fought that deportation case, and a decision was finally rendered after about a year that he was, in fact, an overstay. 
Now, the essential problem in a deportation case and what lies beneath the surface is that the only way one can get out of it is either to ask permission to leave this country voluntarily and get out, which John was not prepared to do, or to apply for permanent resident status. And the law prescribes that any person who had ever been convicted of any offense, no matter how small, relating to the possession of marijuana at any time in his lifetime and under any circumstances cannot obtain residence. And so that what was happening when the government did this little routine of revoking his stay and charging him with being an overstay, they were putting him, locking him actually into a position where the only application he could make was one which they were pretty sure he could never succeed in. Which was? For, pardon? The application that he would make would be one that he for would never permanent succeed residence. in. Permanent residence. Yes. All right. Now, we applied for permanent residence for John and for Yoko. We won Yoko's case, and she was granted residence, but John's case was denied. We went up on appeal before the Board of Immigration Appeals, and we lost there as well. And we are now before the United States Circuit Court of Appeals on the same issue. And basically, on that case, the issue resolves itself into whether or not what happened in England amounts to possession under our law, and whether what he possessed in England was actually marijuana under our law. You see, the substance which John was convicted of possessing, he pleaded guilty, was called cannabis resin. That's a generic term, and it includes a number of substances. We had one of our, the top experts in the United States, a psychiatrist at uh, Harvard Medical School, testify, and he, was the, he gave the only expert testimony. And his testimony was that cannabis resin is not marijuana, and marijuana is not cannabis resin. Yet the Immigration Service came to the conclusion that it was marijuana. And finally, with respect to the possession aspect, our law in the United States is very clear with respect to possession. You cannot be convicted in this country for possessing an illicit substance unless it is clear that you had a knowledge as to the illicit nature of the substance that you had. Mm -hmm. In England, at the time of John's conviction, a law existed which had been uniformly criticized throughout the world and which was later repealed. And it provided that the government did not have to prove that you knew the nature of the substance whatsoever. So that if you possessed a bottle and you thought it had aspirin in it, and in fact if the aspirin turned out to be some serious drug, you must have pleaded guilty under those circumstances because there was no way uh, out. And that actually was the legal situation that forced John into this, and that's where we stand with respect to the immigration. Yeah. I know that this is not a set, excuse me. Yeah, I was just going to say one interesting point was that when they started the initial case, they claimed that it was a local <coughs> New York problem, and they also started the proceedings against John and Yoko. Well, halfway or a third of the way through the proceedings, or whatever the number is, they discovered that actually Yoko did not have any record in England and also she had a green card by a previous American husband. So this local case that was just no another case like any other alien, which is what they kept claiming, was not one of those cases. So then they suddenly had to find something else, which was this overstay business, which they pulled a, a fast one. And so they had to give Yoko the green card. And they st now, one of them, I think his name is Green, keeps writing to the papers saying, they're still treating me like a normal citizen a normal alien, right, only on overstay, not, no longer mentioning about marijuana and the original normal reason I was being thrown out. And it's just interesting that the case keeps changing to suit them, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question about that in a second. We'll continue after these final announcements from our affiliated stations. I know that this is not a satisfactory question, but maybe you have a satisfactory answer for it. You know, when, uh, when all of us were little, we were told... Uh, why try to be someplace where they tell you that you're not wanted? You know, if you go over at a friend's house and his mother says, hey, I don't want you around, you, you come home. You could live almost anywhere you wanted to in this world. Yeah. And so if you're getting hassled this way, and this does not in any way negate the incorrectness of the hassle, if yeah. it is as your attorney states, why put up with it? 
Because I'd like to live in the land of the free, Tom. And also, if it was up to Joe Doe on the street, he either doesn't care about it or would be glad to have an old beetle living here, you know? <laughs> you know, if I get in a cab uh, uh, with a cab driver, it's nothing to do with music or anything. He'll ask me, how are you doing? I hope you can stay. So in, on your average citizen either doesn't care or wouldn't mind me staying here. I like to be here because this is where the music came from. This is what influenced my whole life and got me where I am today, <laughs> as it were. And I, I love the place. I'd like to be here. I've got a lot of friends here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where I want to be, you know. Statue of Liberty, welcome. I even brought my own cash. Brooklyn Bridge, want to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're the ones that buy our bridges. <laughs> I should say that this program is being videotaped, what, uh, this is on the air, the 28th of April, so it's about 20 days ahead of schedule yeah. as we sit in the studio now. And there could very well be developments, I, I suppose, I'm just guessing here, between now and the air date for this that will possibly make this whole conversation moot if you're that far along. I don't know. Is that true, Counselor? It's quite possible. We, there is another case which we haven't discussed, and that is our case against the government. We've oh, you've gone, got one against them. That's true. Yeah. We've gone to the court on three separate occasions, but the action uh, that I'm talking about is the selective prosecution action. We had some information uh, that the deportation proceedings against John were not normally brought. Certainly the procedure followed was not normal. And we had learned that rumors got to the Senate Internal Security Committee that John had some idea, or was rumored to have some idea, of appearing at the Republican National Convention in 1972 and leading a, an anti-Vietnam War demonstration or the like. Uh, and that this information in the form of a memorandum was transmitted by Senator Strom Thurmond to the then Attorney General, John Mitchell, who may have at the time been sitting with the uh, uh, other hat as well as head of CREEP, the committee to re elect, uh, re -elect the president. The, president. Yes, the former president. And we understand that a series of memoranda led all the way down to the district director in New York and that the action uh, he took was not as a result of John's immigration status, but rather as a result or an intention to prevent John from exercising constitutionally protected what are, what rights. Are, what are they afraid of you doing if you have permanent residence here? I, I don't know. I think uh, in, when it was started, somebody didn't want me here, and now they probably don't mind, you know. It's just that it's a bureaucratic thing. It's gone on, and how, how do we stop it? You know, maybe whoever makes the decision doesn't know whether it would be either politically right or... What's going to happen if we suddenly stop now when we started it? I mean, it's very sort of embarrassing for everyone, I guess. Mm -hmm. the, and I don't think that half the people that were started it are now having their own problems. <laughs> right? So, I don't know where I am. I know there's a different lot of people in charge of my case now. And I'm sure they're not as hot to get me out because they, they didn't even have the Republican convention in San Diego. And I was not committed to go there either. Mm -hmm. so, I, I only I have less than one minute left. You know, you've been a very uh, low-key and very mild-mannered uh, 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 guest on this program, and yet I've, I've heard you described as being an egomaniac, and I'm having a little trouble uh, understanding that description of you vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way that you've really been during this hour we spent together. Why would you be called that? Uh, because uh, one gets a reputation, you know, for one thing or another, whether it's true or false. If being an egomaniac means I believe in what I do and my art or my music, in that respect, you can call me that, you know? And I believe in what I do. And I'll say it, you know? And uh, otherwise, this is pretty much me, you know? <laughs> Apart from being on TV, you know? Well, you're one of the nicest egomaniacs <laughs> I've ever met. Well, so are you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it can be said for the record, and I'm certain you all know that following that program, uh, John Lennon was, in fact, granted permanent residence here in the United States and lived here in New York with his wife Yoko until he died last night.
Uh, my next guest is the syndicated columnist Lisa Robinson, who recently did an exclusive article uh, on John Lennon in the New York Post. In it, she says that she was impressed with his great sense of humor, his devoted family life, and his overall gentleness. Uh, she'll soon be syndicated, by the way, through the New Times Syndicate, not the New York Times Syndicate. I made a mistake at the top of the show. The New Times Syndicate. And in that uh, uh, presentation, she'll discuss further memories and memoirs of John Lennon. We'll meet Lisa Robinson right after these announcements now for the NBC television stations. We're back now currently with Lisa Robinson, the columnist, and I'm going to switch myself again. She is, in fact, going to be writing for the New York Times Syndicate, syndicate, yes. not the New Times Syndicate. So, right. we, well, it's one or the other. It's the New York Times Syndicate. Right. Uh, these aren't pleasant circumstances, but I want to ask you about, uh, first of all, about just watching this thing again with John Lennon. Here in the studio, we were talking about, you know, I had the long hair, and some of the ladies were saying they were wearing mini skirts at the time and go-go boots and white shoes and stuff. And, we were all kind of laughing about things that we did five and six years ago when that tape was made. So it was kind of fun to see that again. And well, that was right around the time when John also sort of started to stay home. And um, he, dis he didn't disappear, really. He was very much with his family for five years. And he looked quite different than the way he's He was going through a long looked. hair yeah. period, too, at the time. Yeah. He was almost... Although not a leisure suit. No. Period well, they made me wear those then, yeah. sad to say. He was kind of like a house husband there for uh, Yes, that's what he five said. Years, he huh? the last time that we spoke, he he said that he was in fact a house husband and that the most important thing for him was to be with his family, to be with Yoko and to be with his 5-year-old son Sean. And he said, you know, people are angry at me because I'm not working, because I'm not making records, but that's uh, why should they be angry because I'm doing what I want to do he said I've been famous for 12 to 15 years there's been incredible pressure I don't want to just keep churning out the same stuff just because I can do it well just because I'm a craftsman and he felt that the time had come for him to get to know his son because he felt he had missed out on that with his first child who's now I think 17 his first son Julian and he really wanted to stay home he always said he liked hanging around the house anyway, that writing songs was hanging around the house, except instead of writing songs, now he was writing menus. And I said to him, well, what did you do every day? And he said, well, I got up and I would make breakfast. And breakfast was a big deal, and I would make something for Yoko, and if she would wake up and she'd be in a funk and she'd have a bad day ahead of her with business, because Yoko, self-admittedly handled the family business, which you can imagine was extensive mm -hmm. in but their case. But then she did it all, all the contractual She's an uh, amazing businesswoman, very strong woman, really. And uh, so she did, took care of the family business, and he took care of the house, and he did the breakfast. Then he might take a nap, listen to a little Muzak, he told me maybe go for a walk. What um, music? He said he just wasn't interested in really what was happening with rock and roll. He canceled all his subscriptions to the trade publications. He didn't want to go to the clubs. He felt he'd done it. He'd seen it. He knew what it all was. And he just wanted to be with his family and just sort of find out a little bit more about himself in a very introverted way. He'd been on this crazy ride for so long. I mean, mm -hmm. you just can't imagine the whole... They, both John and Yoko referred to the 60s as an orgy which I'm sure for the Beatles it probably was. And um, then in the 70s, they were aware of the breakdown of the family system, particularly in this country to some degree, and they were very concerned with keeping their family intact. And it was a role reversal of a sort. They did, I, don't think they, I don't think there was one day really where they sat down and said, OK, you take care of the child, I'm going to take care I'll of the take business. Care of the business yeah. But it might have evolved into something very close to that because Yoko even said, I carried the child for nine months, now it's your turn. And Yoko, anybody who knows them, knows that she had a profound influence on his life, deeply profound influence on his life. A she was an inspiration to him. Influence. He told me that he would have been completely insane had it not been for her. In fact, for a period of time when they separated in the early 1970s and he went to California and he told me he acted like a total lunatic and she completely saved him. And he was an inspiration to her artistically. Uh, you have to look at this, you know, John Lennon was a, a boy from Liverpool, from a working class situation, mm -hmm. who went to art school, who wanted to be an artist, who became one of the most famous people in the world, who had everything offered to him. He could have anything he wanted. and. 
he met a woman from a completely different background. Yoko was from a well-to-do Japanese Oriental background. And she would not fetch and carry for him. You know, Yoko does not fetch and carry for anybody. And completely turned his head around. And you talk about the liberated woman and all that, but it was quite amazing to see John evolve over the years with the kind of influence that she had over him because people said it was power and she was like a dragon lady or she told mm -hmm. him what to do. It wasn't that at all. It was the fact that he was so flexible and he was so highly evolved, I think, as a human being that he was able to turn around from that very traditional kind of macho rock star trip and be a man who could be a parent and a father and a husband and cook. And he told me he took Polaroids of his first loaf of bread. He was so excited. And um, <laughs> I mean, just little things like that. You when know? you went to their home for interviews, I'm assuming that you went to their home. I have. All right. We, we had heard stories that they purchased apartment after apartment yeah. and kept expanding their home throughout the uh, cooperative complex on the west side at which they lived. Was it a big place, large place? Huge. Really? Yes, but um, I haven't been in, they have several uh, different apartments in that building now, but I haven't been to the new ones. But I asked John about this and I said, what are you, are you buying up the building? What are these rumors? Yoko has one apartment just for her fur coats. Uh, you're <laughs> buying up the building. And he said, well, she believes in buying real estate. She's a smart lady, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, a lot of people, I suppose, put them down for being rich, but they were rich. Did it look like the home of a rich person? I read, I believe it, believe it was your account in the New York Post, which appeared here recently, where you talked about the uh, the big television screen. Maybe somebody else's mm, account somebody then, but else, uh, they I had an advent I'd, I television. That. But it didn't it didn't seem as if it were a lavishly outfitted place. No, well, Yoko has amazingly wonderful taste. She really, she, she loves Art Deco, and she loves Egyptian art, and she collects these things. And um, the stuff that she has, I use the word stuff, but the things that she has, the objects she has, the art that she has, is very, very good and very tasteful. Mm -hmm. But I, I find, you know, the funny thing is when you talk about John Lennon, people so often talk about money and possessions and things and everything, but you know, you talk to him, and we just saw the interview, and, and he was just the most amazingly personable, mm -hmm. witty, down-to-earth, funny, sarcastic. And in some ways even self-deprecating of himself, you yeah. know, really. Yeah, I mean, he down. called me up once, I remember, he said, hello, it's me, John Beatles. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I mean, he just, uh, to me, having interviewed rock and roll musicians for quite some time now, well, uh, to say that he, he'll, he's missed is not saying really what I'm feeling, but he was certainly very, very special and uh, had tremendous power. Tell the little story about the trays, would you? The beetle trays? Oh, the trays. Oh, I once was talking to John and I was, we were doing an interview and we were talking about memorabilia and he was showing me some of the Beatles memorabilia that he had had that people collected and sent to him. And he said, well, I've got a lunchbox, and I've got a thermos, and I've got this, and I've got that. And then I said, oh, I've got a set of four trays. And he said, trays? I don't have a tray. So I sent him one of my trays. <laughs> now I just have three. <laughs> what did happen last night? Have you oh, been able to piece God. anything together as to what happened? There was one story that the, uh, the suspect in the case had been hassling John for days and bothering him for autographs, and there was another story that uh, he hadn't been. Have you been able to piece anything together as to what went on? Well, I don't know. All I know is what I just heard on the news, which is I think they said that he had come here specifically. I, I See, I don't know what's the right thing to say here, but one of the news reports was that he had come a few days ago from <coughs> Hawaii, I believe, and had hung around the Dakota. Um, see, this is the problem, you know. People hang around. People have been hanging around trying to see John Lennon for years in England when they were, they had that building on Savile Row, Apple. Girls hung around that building day and night for months. And I've never been over to the Dakota without there have been a few people sort of hanging around. And when they were recording this year in the recording studio, there were people hanging around. And how do you know? You All know? people who perform or are visible are subject to people hanging around. And I just wonder in the minds of some famous people tonight if there isn't a little concern about how easy it is to be 
hung around. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Personal well, security. Some, there. Some, yeah. Some people have bodyguards, you know, and some people, I guess, like John, just felt that he didn't want to live that way anymore. I mean, the great ironic tragedy about this is that he practically stayed home for five years and came out this year to make music. And, you know, last night, I mean, I just still can't believe it. But last night when he, when Yoko and John were coming home, they were coming home from the recording studio where I believe they were remixing some of Yoko's songs. And this was a, a source of particular pride to John because, you know, Yoko really took a lot of bad raps. And a lot of people felt that her music was wild, just wildly uncommercial and noise. And when I saw Yoko this past summer for the first time in a long time, I said, you know, you were way ahead of your time. All the punk stuff that's happening now, Patti Smith, Lena Lovitch, Nina Hagen, all these singers, the B-52s, they sound like you did six years ago. And she looked at me and she said, really, you know? And then she was at that time writing songs and so was John, and they didn't announce it until later. But what I was going to say was that they went out to make music now. And I think that they were possibly thinking of performing live or doing something, whether having a concert or not a tour. John told me he didn't want to do 40 cities mm -hmm. in six weeks. He'd had that. But he missed being with Sean, and yet he still felt that he wanted to create. And he said, you know, it's the real turnabout of the liberated woman. He said, because I find myself saying to my son, well, Daddy wouldn't be happy unless he was making music now, so you have to understand that I'm going to the studio mm -hmm. and I'm going to do these things. Um, and yet he was a little conflicted about it. He said he missed the time spending, he missed the time that he had spent with Sean. And um, just being able to have all those little moments, watching him say a new word for the first time or doing something for the first time, all of those kind of things were really special to him. And uh, then this happens. Yeah. Thanks for coming by on a difficult night for yourself. Thank you, okay. Tom. We'll be right back here with Mr. Jack Douglas after these announcements from our sponsors and from the NBC television stations. Jack Douglas first met John Lennon in 1971 as an engineer on the album entitled Imagine. He produced his last album, Double Fantasy, and was with the musician and his wife last night. He is joining us this evening to discuss the plans that John Lennon had for the 1980s and the optimism he had going into a new decade with a revived career. He did see the 70s as being a time off, didn't he? He was looking forward to, to, to doing something completely different during the 1980s. Well, he saw the, the beginning of the 70s, as we all did, as a time for me, a time for us all to say, no, I'm going to do something for me. I've spent the 60s fighting for the cause, whatever cause it was. And he was looking at the 80s as a time to say, I'm going to do something for me, but I'm not going to step on anyone else to do it. I'm not going to exclude anyone else. Um, and that's what he was looking for in the 80s. What kinds of plans did he have, Jack? What was he looking forward to? Well, I, I, think, I think the first single off the album, which was called Starting Over, which we, we picked while we were doing the album, was, uh, was the feeling that he wanted to have for the 80s, that we are, in fact, in the 80s, we are starting over that it's time to be optimistic about the future, that it's time to write off George Orwell in 1984. It's time to forget about those things, that in 84 we can have what we want if we work together and for ourselves. Um, there were other songs on, on that particular album that uh, that represented what he wanted to do and what he wanted others to do. For instance, clean up time. What he was trying to say is that it's time to forget about drugs. It's time to forget about alcohol. It's time to take a look at what you have around you, your family, and to take advantage of it because those are things that are really meaningful. In watching the replay of the interview, I was interested when he and I were talking about uh, uh, the possession of marijuana, and he kept referring to it, dope, dope, dope. And I was thinking to myself, and we've all fooled around with that stuff, a uh, little grass now and again, or alcohol, booze, whatever. If it's all so great, why do they call it dope? 
It makes you dopey when you stop and think That's about it. True. It's so great. Why do they call it dope? It, it, it was interesting to hear him talking about that. That's then. true. He must have been very pleased, and yourself as well, that the album Double Fantasy was a tremendous success. I believe it's gold already, heading for platinum. Well, the response to it uh, was was remarkable. In in fact, uh, yesterday while we were working, uh, David Geffen came up to the control room. Now, identify him for uh, me. David is the uh, president of Geffen Records, okay. on which, uh, David, on which uh, John's album is distributed. And, uh, and he came up and he said, well, congratulations, mm -hmm. boys. Two weeks out and your album is gold and quickly head headed for platinum. And, uh, and the single is going to number one. And, and John was just thrilled. I mean, he's been there many times before, but after five years, he, uh, he just jumped up and down like a kid. He was During the production of the album, was there any uh, negative anticipation? Gee, we've been away for five years. Maybe it won't be so successful oh, so absolutely. quickly. Uh, jitters, really. John was definitely one to play himself down. He, d he didn't consider himself John Lennon superstar, mm -hmm. but more John Lennon artist, hoping that other people would, would understand what he was trying to say. He didn't take it for granted that people would just go out and buy his records. Um, he hoped they would. Uh, but, but when it was starting to happen, the way it was, he was just thrilled. He was like a kid. He was very happy. And uh, on top of that, yesterday, uh, we had just finished mixing a, a new tune for Yoko. Could I interrupt you for just a couple of minutes? I got Certainly. a commercial to do. We'll continue with Mr. Jack Douglas right after these announcements. Thank you. Spending a little time here with Mr. Jack Douglas, who is the producer of uh, Double Fantasy, the Lennon's most recent album. Go ahead. In 1968, you came into the business as a producer. You were just... I was a musician before that, and, and uh, in 1968, uh, I was part of the smoke dope, take acid generation, riot in the street, and go mad. And, uh, and I was listening to that White Album, and I said, I said, by God, what I really want to do is produce records. I said, that's, that's really what I want. And I said, there's probably nothing more than I'd want to do is produce the Beatles or produce John Lennon. And, uh, and then after a lot of hard work uh, being janitor in a studio and finally becoming an engineer and working with John in 71, there was, a, there was a, an immediate communication, almost the kind of communication that a fan feels when he listens to a Beatle record, mm -hmm. it was there. It was there when I met him. It was an, an instant warmth, and we became very close. And then, uh, and then I started working with Yoko. Now, previous to that, uh, the engineers who were working with Yoko were running out of the control room when she was starting to work. But, uh, but I, I understood what she was trying to do. And it was appreciated by both John and Yoko. And we did a lot of work together. And after the five years, uh, I was coming back from Los Angeles. And I got a telephone call from Yoko. And she said, John and I want to go back. And we'd like you to produce. And, uh, and my first reaction was hallelujah, but not because I was producing the album but because they he was going back, back yeah. to work. Yeah. And I think after I hung up the phone, I realized, wow, they've asked me to do it. I mean, that's a, a truly amazing. How did you uh, get through the night last night, young man? I, uh, I didn't get through the night, really. I, uh, after returning from the hospital, um, I, uh, I went for a walk. Uh, all the way down to Grand Central Station. I live uptown, and I hung around Grand Central Station for a while and, uh, and tried to make sense out of a completely senseless act as, as best I could um, because I had just left him at 10.30, mm -hmm. and we were feeling really up, 
we were meeting again at 10 o'clock in the morning to continue our work. We were feeling really good. The, the album was gold. It was on its way to platinum. Yoko was receiving the kind of press that we had prayed for. And, uh, and, and that was making John very happy. And uh, everything was going well. And after it happened, I, I heard about 20 minutes later, usually uh, because I only live two blocks from John, I ride uptown with them every night in, in the limo. But I had another session after that one. And, uh, and I was in my session. I was told that uh, John had been shot. And we just immediately went to Roosevelt Hospital. And of course, it wasn't long after that we realized he was dead. And I spent the rest of the night uh, in the streets just trying to communicate with him in some way. It just his There's no way that you'll ever make sense out of it but um, carry the message for him, which I think he would have wanted you to that's, do. That's what I, that's what I mean. And, uh, that's why I'm here. I don't think I could be here any other way except to say that he meant the 80s to be optimistic and that he wants to tell, he wanted to tell everyone that it's going to be all right if we pull together. Thank you for coming here tonight. I'm really up against the clock, but well, my deepest sympathies to you and to the family, and thank you so much for coming here this thank evening. Thank you. I've got to do this commercial. We'll be right back. We'll get back on the track tomorrow night. I thank you all for being with us this evening and from New York City. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody. <laughs>